Good evening. The crowds are getting bigger. That's nice to see. Welcome to the second of 11 lectures. Tonight we have Eugene Cupper, and I have kind of a very short kind of introduction that I think really is going to sum it up. Um, Eugene has been practicing for 27 years, since he was 13 years old. I think he's, he has the distinction, I think, of getting his first building up when he was 15 years old. He's been teaching for a decade. That's 10 years. <laughs> From what I hear, and after listening to Coy last week, um, you never know what he has up his sleeve. So let's see what he's going to say. I think he has some very personal and kind of interesting ideas that he's going to express tonight. Eugene. in the dark, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm going to talk about doing architecture. Uh, light upstairs, it's extremely bright, and it's just washing out the whole screen. <clears throat> Maybe I can uh, help them along. <laughs> I don't think that the right projector is on yet, is it? I'm, I'm told that all the projectors are, are ready to go, are pre-focused, right, and are ready, ready to go. And I'm supposed to have some buttons to push. That puts me over here. Okay. That, that blue hurts the blue that's on the screen. Who's, turn off the light, please. I spent 20 minutes mounting a piece of purple gelatin inside of a slide frame in order for you to look at the screen this way. So. <laughs> to ease your eyes. Ready. It's, it's always difficult to talk about architecture, and it's probably more difficult to do. But uh, the usual procedure is to explain a, a design process and to explain how a given project solves a problem. Uh, I'm going to try to not do that and to see if I can get away with it. Uh, I'd like to talk about doing architecture which is to immerse oneself in a certain set of attitudes and a willingness to accept that architecture is a discipline and a theory, which is apart from any other kind of human enterprise, that uh, architecture is a language which refers as much to itself and to its own procedures as it does to the prerequisites or the uh, cultural economic forces in which it locates itself. I'd like to reference architecture. First, I'd like to focus the slides. I can't focus the slides from here. <laughs> you better not do that. What? Do what? Oh, that's for video? They want to wash out the slides? OK. Is there someone operating the slide projectors? Could they please focus the slide on the right a little bit? I'll only ask once if it stays focused. That would be good. There's people up there doing very precise work on that scaffold, and if they can't see what they're doing, it's, it's dangerous work. Right. 
There, that's much nicer. Thank you. I think the one on the left is focused, isn't it? Right. Okay, now, not to be fussy, but uh, uh, this could be on the same line as that one, and they could be a little bit <laughs> closer together. This is to be fussy because really, if one is going to engage oneself in these kinds of enterprises, not giving lectures, but doing architecture, there are certain things that you're constantly looking for. There are certain attitudes that have to be uh, brought into focus and, uh, and certain alignments. This is all preferatory talk because, there we are, that, I like that. And maybe you could just kick it a little bit to the left, the one you're working on. Oh, that, that'll, that's perfect, there, that's it. I think that's, that's about right, because some of them will overlap. All right, lecture begins. <coughs> Architecture positions itself in the domain of earth and the domain of sky. It's a way in which the culture can diagram itself and to find a set of lines, a set of forms, a way of carving into the earth, a way of building into the sky, a way of finding a metaphor of those two things and finding a, an architecture which will be responsive to the basic fact of the inhabitation of earth or sky. Very carefully, we measure out a set of lines in the earth and walk those lines, looking for a way in which to situate our behavior and looking for a means by which an architectural form can uh, give us location and meaning on this earth. The lines are measured and the lines are walked. The final product is a, is a form of behavior a desire to complete architecture by means of a, uh, an experience which is both culturally felt, it's a, uh, an everyday, ordinary experience, but because of the uh, special properties of architecture as an art, it produces uh, a, a very strange kind of intersection uh, which uh, admits both of the commonplace and of the transcendent. The diagrams we make uh, may appear on paper, they may appear in the ground. Uh, they are figments of our consciousness. They're ways in which we clarify our own idea and our own orientation toward the ground we occupy or the sky toward which we strive. We can find lines in the ground and emphasize them. We can establish doodles on paper and uh, then look for a way in which those doodles can surround and represent uh, a, a domain of occupation. I'll try to identify these uh, projects uh, only in, um, in passing. Uh, the site of the Washburn House and a, uh, a schoolboy's doodle of the Nelson House. Uh, the, uh, what is real what is seen equals what is unseen. Architecture is something that, because of its intersection with the commonplace experience, uh, can be ignored, can be passed mm -hmm. over, uh, can be treated as merely an incident. But uh, architecture as well has a cumulative effect. It has a method of crossing you over the threshold into a transcendent experience. It, it has a way of uh, putting you in contact with ideas about the occupation of the domain of the earth uh, that one would not otherwise have if architecture did not op operate as an offering to the spirit. The markings which we use can be on paper, they can be in built form, they can be uh, the tool that we select is, is the tool which will uh, uh, most accurately and adequately diagram the environment which we're intending. Uh, Sometimes the lines that we draw on paper are very precise seeming. <coughs> Sometimes our perception of realities are very vague. I would like to use these two slides to call your attention to the dreamlike state of certain realities and the seeming precision of our abstractions. We even do this as we work. Uh, we build an initial vagueness. I think the left slide is supposed to be even more focused so that its vagueness is, is understood as being vague rather than out of focus. Uh, the vagueness that we put into our drawings 
is a provisional ambiguity that allows our minds to freely operate so that they can that, that thoughts that present themselves to us can close along many possible uh, lines of closure. Uh, that uh, we open ourselves up to a field of possible stimuli and the drawings that we make, the models we build, are torn or smeared or smudged, are gazed at, uh, are forgotten, in order that we uh, continue to keep our mind open to the idea, keep our mind available for exposure to the essence. Sometimes our drawings are tangled with lines to begin to probe for the explicit means by which a project will be implemented. These are drawings of the Washburn House. It's a house in Berkeley which I'm currently working on. The, the, the lines uh, which we use simultaneously clarify and probe. They, uh, they ask for a closure on an idea, but at the same time they want to open up to an idea. Now this is all in the realm of doing architecture. It's in the realm of, of identifying that aspect of the medium, the medium being the medium of building, the medium of inhabitation, the medium of, of, of drawing, the medium of, of uh, crafting materials. Uh, that as we uh, reach for a resolution, we at the same time allow for a, an ambiguity and irresolution. So here, the attempt to uh, synchronize the intent of two representations of a house, uh, looking for a set of substantial markings that will stand in for an eventual uh, concrete reality, but at the same time has its own concrete reality, uh, a reciprocal uh, possibility with our own action to work on the paper so that the paper becomes the architecture in this case, that, the, that the, our hand moving across the paper is a probing uh, for the architectural idea. Now this is not to place any primacy on the drawing before the model, before the uh, working drawing, before the building, before the inhabitation. Uh, what I will try to do with this set of images is to uh, describe how uh, something which may be built in one's work uh, at, can add to or clarify something which is still in the speculative state or that something which is in the speculative state uh, is retained as a critique of a, of a project just completed or that an idea may have a, an essence, may have a theoretical meaning to it that transcends both the built work and uh, the intended work. That is to say, it's an offering only to the realm of architecture. <coughs> and so, uh, what there is is a dialectic process which is set up. A desire to clarify an idea and a, a desire at the same time to erase that idea and to replace it with another, perhaps more potent idea. We're always referencing our current project to the project just completed or the project next beginning. We're always looking for a way in which we can find a three-dimensional expression of a two-dimensional representation. We're always looking for a way in which we can turn a time-dependent experience into a static drawing. We're always looking for a way in which we can uh, devise a poetic language which can be precise and technical. We're always looking for a way to build a building that will transcend the mere act of building. As I say, the, we stand on our own shoulders as we work. Having built a model, having made a drawing, having built a building, having experienced a building, having detailed a building, having been with the people, uh, there's a fullness which emerges out of the work. And this is a, a fullness which comes of the reciprocity of all those things. It does not come from a step-by-step -step, uh, set of procedures which lead from a, a given problem to a given solution. Rather, it's an immersion in a whole series of possible uh, situations, a whole set of possible architectures. And the work of the architect in doing architecture, not in uh, doing, uh, providing architectural services, but the architect in doing architecture is to expose oneself and finally to expose one's work uh, to the principles 
uh, to which architecture itself uh, refers. Those are concrete principles. They're, they're largely physical principles. They deal with issues of wall. They deal with issues of window, of roof, of door, of chimney, of ground, of sky, of movement. Here again, a piece of uh, a, a fragment from a model for the Washburn House uh, is checked and validated against uh, a recently completed project, the Nielsen House. Uh, not, not to make a superficial uh, a comparison of form, but to uh, allow that, that, uh, that within one house lies the seed for an architecture which could give rise to something else, which may be a house, it may not be a house. Now the spirit of play has to enter into all this. Um, as soon as one begins to manipulate the medium, the medium is something which is active. It's something that is speaking to you as much as you are speaking to it. Uh, and so, uh, like a child with blocks, uh, the game is instituted. The, the uh, dialectic between the medium which one is working and the intended result and the dream which lies beyond both of those uh, is, is put in, in, into, uh, in, into action. Having a hard time knowing which button stands for what. Again, checking back, uh, looking ahead, looking ahead for the project on the right, looking uh, toward completion for the Washburn House, and simultaneously critiquing the Nielsen House by, an, by a, a new set of energies which is poured into the next project. Uh, also, asking for the security to know that one's, uh, that one's actions in doing architecture uh, are real and are strong and, and will lead to uh, verifiable results. So we look back. Now we're looking ahead. Uh, excuse me. We look back and see what we did in a similar situation a few years ago. We look at the energy that we invested in that product. The product of, in this case, crafting the model and, and uh, wonder if the, the, uh, the, the situation in which we placed ourselves was artificial or whether it was real. Whether we were exposing ourselves to the issues that the building uh, was meant to address or whether we were simply using an improvisation or whether we were uh, uh, satisfying a, a contractual obligation or whether we were uh, engaging in a road activity. Uh, and then uh, once again, we look back at what we've just done. Uh, uh, the model uh, is, is freer in this case. The, the model is something which is, has a more open-minded attitude toward the exploration of that form. That form can only be approached open-mindedly because of the precision of the, of the uh, model which, uh, which had preceded the previous work. This is not to say that the works themselves are going to be that different in quality or character, but it's to say that the, uh, that the issues to which the work can address itself uh, can be either uh, precise or imprecise, uh, uh, vague or deterministic. And, and uh, finally, the question is not one of method, but the question is, is one of the incorporate idea. Once again, uh, by comparing, uh, in this case, the Washburn House on the right, with uh, a project for UCLA Extension done about eight years ago. Uh, uh, we are looking for a theoretical proposition to which both projects address themselves. We're looking for a statement about the way the ground is organized, how lines are drawn on the ground, how we walk those lines, how some of those lines are built up into walls, others into towers, how spaces are gathered, how transparency between uh, uh, functional or behavioral domains are achieved, how uh, uh, places of repose and activity are, are organized. We can examine these principles in detail. We can look for them. We can expect them as a quality of the architecture we do. If we see the Washburn House as a solution to the problem of a family dwelling, uh, we won't necessarily raise an architectural issue. If we see the problem of designing a conference and education center, uh, for a campus as a, pure, as a, as a question of, of program and technology, uh, we may not raise an architectural issue. 
again the two the media that are used to explore the same problem don't necessarily have to be commensurable with one another they can be put into a dialectical relationship with one or with one another the drawing does not have to be a precise indication of what is intended in the model the model at the same time is a sensual encounter that the drawing does not represent the drawing is a commitment to an idea and the model is a commitment to a thing the model itself as it's rotated and turned and caressed investigated uh, clarified made solid uh, pieces that have to be found which which aid in the identity of the model may in fact give us ideas as to a possible architecture we may devise a kind of architecture simply because we had to solve the associated problem of working the model the level of precision and the level of describability is uh, an issue that we, we should constantly uh, use as a method uh, against which we, uh, we judge our results. At the same time, uh, the essential ambiguity, the essential sloppiness of our work has to be retained uh, as, a, as a possible source of new ideas. Otherwise, we sterilize around a certain pre-formulated set of issues. Again, we check our work constantly. Uh, we check our work against our own work, previous work. Uh, we look for a point by point correspondence uh, between a previously executed project and the latest project. Uh, and we examine how we've deviated uh, from that in some detail. Uh, this, uh, in, the, in the slide on the right, you'll see that there's a, a narrow slot through the fireplace uh, a, a steep stair up to a door. That was the first time I used thickness in a building I designed. Uh, prior to that, all the thickness of my buildings had to do with the physical thickness of a wall rather than the experiential thickness of a mass. That's something that sh comes from working the medium of modern architecture, which uh, is not an architecture of mass. But uh, if one is going to expose oneself to a broad range of architectural issues, and to draw into one's vocabulary and one's understanding of what is theoretically possible in architecture, uh, then one looks for ways uh, in which uh, concepts of mass are articulated and inhabited. Now, this may not be terribly important observation uh, for this one slide, but it happens to be uh, incorporated into the entire discipline of, 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 the, of the new project, the Washburn House, so that one incident in this particular uh, living room uh, deals with the question of penetrating a mass and of dwelling within a mass. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, I, I would check the slide on the right against the slide on the re uh, left uh, just to make sure that certain of the principles that were indicated as a theoretically possible architecture earlier on uh, have some meaning in terms of a built space. And so we look for places of motion. We look for uh, ways to get from one place of motion to another place of motion. We look for uh, the dwelling, idling place of quiet activity and comfort. Uh, we look for a certain generosity in, uh, in the defining of spaces and yet a certain tightness in the way those spaces are architecturally ordered. Uh, in other words, one could begin to uh, uh, critique one's work uh, and ask it uh, difficult questions and to try to determine to what degree one was succeeding or failing. I, I talked earlier of the necessary craftsmanship that goes into the making of a model. Now, uh, this is simply a white cardboard model. And uh, the white cardboard model, of course, is, is, a, is a favorite tool of, of architects, or I should say rather a favorite toy of architects. What it tends to do is clarify and condense uh, the qualities of architecture. It tends to cast sharp shadows. It produces a high level of visibility in a miniature which uh, uh, causes a sort of monumentality to occur. Uh, it has a sense of closure and completeness and clarity and complexity all at one time. Simply the act of, of uh, modifying a cardboard model. I think we're losing some. Maybe finally we turned it down. Do people in the back here now? Do, can you hear in the back? Good. I, maybe they just improved the sound system then. Uh, 
the reason that that energy needs to be observed as the work goes on, on the building of that model, on the crafting that model, is that that is the state of mind into which we are all entering as we do the work. The model is not done necessarily only as a description of the project. The model is done in order to produce a willing state of mind and a receptive state of mind to the uh, achievement of, of a particular architectural idea. I would claim that the work that went into the model in terms of the conceptual energy is greater than the work that went into the completion of the project in that sense because it, it served to identify, clarify, and intensify uh, the architectural objective. And that architectural objective can only be realized if uh, during the process of initiating the concept that there is a commitment to an idea and a commitment to a thing, a commitment to a way of crafting that thing. And so it becomes part of the, part of the emergent process of recognizing the architectural possibility. At the same time, I think that one has to discipline one's, uh, one's doodling, one's random notations. Uh, the drawing on the right uh, was made during an extended telephone call. It's the only drawing which exists for this project. Uh, I, was, I was talking to, uh, in this case, the, the builder of the, of the project on the left who had bought a piece of property in Malibu and wanted to turn it over and. Uh, and uh, market it for several hundred thousand dollars more, I believe. And uh, uh, I, I, I used his, his comment to, to stimulate for myself a modification and alternation of transformation of an existing architectural idea that was in my head and a kind of random, random doodling process that would allow me to sort of patiently explore a phenomenon that I had no particular commitment to. And so it was free play. It was, it was a, an availability that offered itself to me that could be completed by a telephone doodle. But uh, uh, in this, one of these rare cases, uh, I mean, every time I sit down at the telephone, I don't design a building. But uh, in, in a particularly rare case, you look for a moment in which uh, an idea just wants to come out and put itself on paper. Uh, I think that our current work, in this case the house on the right is, is, is a house in uh, the Hollywood Hills. Uh, it's a remodeling to an existing house. I'll show you more about it a little bit later. Uh, the, the current work is a critique of the existing work. And the, and the existing work is the foundation for and the, in many cases, the cause of the current work or the continuing work. And so uh, uh, we uh, as, as we satisfy one kind of appetite, we're rekindling another kind of appetite. Uh, we uh, ask ourselves certain questions that we forgot to ask uh, in the previous process. And at the same time, we may uh, edit and reconceive uh, based on, on issues that we felt were uh, addressed uh, differently in the previous project. Likewise, here, uh, an image from the Nielsen House is uh, is utilized as, as, a, uh, as a recognizable symbol of cabin in, uh, in the uh, UCLA Alumni Association uh, Conference Center at Lake Arrowhead, uh, a, a planning, architectural planning study that I was engaged in this summer, uh, in which we were simply asked to produce a set of images that would be stimulating to investors uh, so that they can buy the property and, and do some things up there. But that uh, uh, what was interesting and easy for me to do at that point was uh, uh, say uh, what is singular can be multiple, uh, what is uh, a little goofy and a little awkward and a little odd uh, uh, for an idiosyncratic uh, uh, singer-songwriter uh, might not be, uh, it might not be so wrong to do that for, uh, uh, for folks in, in Adidas and, and uh, UCLA t-shirts. Uh, once again, uh, the Arrowhead project on the left, uh, utilizing the vocabulary of roof, window, circulation, of, of processional circulation, uh, the house in, in the Hollywood Hills on the right, uh, uh, dealing with a, a, uh, 
with a, a proportional uh, shift uh, as, as the house either bends down to uh, make uh, a wall near the ground or whether it lifts up to try to grab a hold of the entire two-story mass of, of, of the house. Uh, on the left, the, uh, the groundscape uh, offering as a, as a, as a counterpoise uh, the architecture of the, of the earth, in this case, uh, minimally dealt with, uh, but crafted uh, when it reaches the building in order to uh, begin to develop tectonic form. On the other hand, uh, going back to the extension project of eight years ago, uh, I was looking for a, uh, a systematic method for achieving a, a conference environment, a way in which uh, a, a set of facilities could be programmed, uh, reprogrammed, uh, could be uh, uh, given an overall intelligibility and an overall sense of collective membership. So the discipline of doing that of producing a collective architecture as opposed to a singular architecture uh, had to uh, intersect with uh, the desire to give a building a coherent overall character. Uh, again, the, the plan strategies, uh, which I taught myself in the formulation of the, of the concept for uh, the UCLA extension, which is basically a city building, uh, uh, had to be adjusted, modified, made lyrical, but somehow retained in terms of initial uh, impulse uh, when it went up into the mountains to exist as a rustic architecture. Uh, again, uh, <coughs> referencing back, looking for a way in which uh, uh, an architectural concept extracted from, uh, in this case, a planning study, and not from an architectural study, but the drawings on the right uh, were done as a kind of, of uh, uh, an afterthought to a process which had already completed itself in terms of the normal programming planning uh, activity of the architect. And on the left, uh, a similar request was made by the client, again another UCLA uh, client, uh, but I had already uh, learned the architectural strategy of, of seeking a, a problem statement by a solution proposal. That is to say that the very act of design was a way of identifying and dealing with the problem rather than a way of solving it. And so uh, I, I, I immediately tried to, to create the situation uh, where the concrete essences uh, were the issues that would, would control the project. Now this project is, is very young right now. It's only beginning, the Arrowhead project. And, uh, and there are many phases through which it'll pass. Uh, but I wanted to start with, a, with a, as concrete a set of images as I could that were appropriate for the level at which we were operating. At the same time, uh, to keep in mind that they were being oriented toward a, a larger realm of ideas. Now, the pieces that we make uh, can be more or less carefully made. And when I was talking earlier of the precision of craftsmanship and the caring and the, and the desire to intensify one's experience in order to carry that experience forward, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that one has to fuss over materials and, and methods of craftsmanship and so forth. That the study model, uh, that the gesture, that the fragment, that the, uh, the torn edge uh, can stand in just as strongly for an architectural idea. The question is not precision in terms of the product so much as precision in terms of the intention. And here, the intention in both cases is to work with, to discover for myself, an architecture which combines uh, wall, the thickness of a wall, the movement through it, the penetration through it, uh, the equipping of it by things like stairs and fireplaces, uh, to mark it with gestures of arch or portal or chimney, uh, and to, in the, in the case in the right, amplify it with another concept, say, of balcony. But then as we look at each element, excuse me, as we look at each element, uh, we want to look at those elements building up in collaboration with one another, uh, reinforcing each other, and working toward a more complex, pluralistic understanding of the domain that we're creating with our architecture. And so uh, what exists as an element is then combined with others, and that the, uh, that the interactions among these elements are studied, the, uh, the confusions are accepted as part of, of, of the process of, of knowing it. Now, uh, one pauses you know, at the play table 
uh, with one's toys and says, uh, but isn't this just, you know, aimless play? And, and that's a reasonable question, that that anxiety should creep into our play. We should never stop playing, but the anxiety should creep in and say, uh, what if this doesn't work? So then one wants to, to um, what if it doesn't work? Uh, for example, I pushed the wrong button. Uh, uh, one wants to validate that against a built piece of work to see if there's a meaningful complexity that comes out of the juxtaposition of those elements. To see if, uh, if in fact the clarity and complexity uh, which a model offers us is, the, is of the same order as the clarity of complexity that comes out of the juxtaposition, even the random juxtaposition of, of uh, pieces on the sculptor's table or in the painter's hand or in the architect's workshop. Uh, these two images are enough to confirm my sense of uh, security. I'm secure again and I'm willing to go on and study the project. If I wasn't secure, I'd have to backtrack and, and think about uh, a way in which I would uh, find a clarifying method. I'm always looking for a way to unclarify my method, however. Uh, and so now it's possible to examine each fragment in some detail and to place it within the context of an overall scheme which is represented in a plan. Uh, the plan itself uh, is uh, a situated uh, organization of four thick walls and the spaces, the domains of, of rooms that exist between thick walls. Uh, the thick walls themselves uh, supply the active plastic and the active structural uh, load-bearing, uh, 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 let's say, the, the, the connection between sky and ground. Whereas overhead, uh, the large uh, timber roofing system is, is a free-spanning system of great volume and that the sense of volume uh, tends to be a, an upward or an outward uh, experience, an expansion between the bracketed space uh, which is given by the thickness and by the solidity, by the texture, the color, and the modeling of these walls. And so uh, examining uh, cast of characters from, from left to right, uh, the wall which is of the bed bedroom realm, and this is the wall which exists in the bedroom realm. I should keep it on the screen long enough to look at it uh, and to blow up the floor plan a little. Uh, that's the wall to the left, the thick one with the blue, blue poche on it. And the bedroom realm in this case includes uh, a, a owner's bedroom and a guest bedroom on a lower level. And so the owner's bedroom has a terrace on top of the guest bedroom below. So in this model to the right, you can see that the owner's bedroom, which has the, uh, the uh, arched fireplace, uh, then has a, an opening to the outside into the landscape. It, Within the thickness of the wall is a, is a planting zone which comes in and penetrates uh, through a greenhouse and into the bathtub. The thickness of the wall includes the bathtub, the toilet, the, the uh, 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 sinks, uh, a laundry chute down to the laundry below, uh, a bridge which crosses the main axis of circulation, which is this way through the house, and then over onto a, a sunning terrace or a city watching terrace. since. Uh, if you may remember from a, a previous slide, uh, this is oriented directly toward the Golden Gate Bridge uh, with all of Marin County, all of San Francisco, and all of Oakland and Berkeley below. So that uh, this becomes a, a ceremonial uh, uh, observation place, uh, a place to uh, retreat from and at the same time expose oneself to the, uh, the urban setting and uh, finally uh, to retreat uh, high into the hills uh, to enjoy that privilege. Uh, so then there is the availability of the thickness of the bedroom wall. The, uh, the next wall is a wall which is the separation wall between two houses. Uh, this wall is a wall uh, that can be walked upon. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, slightly thicker. It's the thickest wall. I think it's seven feet thick. It contains a in, in the pr present plan, that's not the present plan, contains in the present plan uh, a guest bathroom, a sauna, a, a spa, which is toward the bottom, and uh, it's on the other side of that wall. You can just see a little tiny bit of blue on the slide on the right, just squeaking out on the, on the left of that slide. 
that's the spa on the other side of that wall. It includes uh, um, a, uh, an alcove in the dining room, which is the, ar the arch-shaped alcove that you see in the center of the, and it includes stairs to get up to the top of the wall to, uh, to uh, walk along the top of the wall, to experience that, to service the solar collectors, uh, uh, to uh, then uh, walk around in back of the uh, fireplace, which is an outdoor fireplace, not shown in that drawing over there, and to walk back on the wall and, and until it intersects with a, uh, with a rocky cliff at the back of the site, which is the place where uh, a, a ceramis, uh, ceramic studio uh, will be located. Uh, a part of the, uh, of the logic and of the poetry of wanting to do this kind of a house with thick walls and a plastic occupation and carving of these thick walls uh, comes from the, the, the nature of the client themselves. The, uh, uh, the woman is a ceramicist uh, member of the Berkeley City Council, an interior designer, and uh, has a, a, a very rich set of attitudes about uh, craftsmanship, about purpose, uh, and, and about uh, the meaning of, of, of the environment that comes out of that craftsmanship and purpose. Uh, the gentleman is a professor of metallurgy uh, and uh, a builder. Um, he owns his own bulldozer. He's building two houses next, next door, and he uh, keeps his graduate students uh, uh, busy uh, writing theses on exotic metals. Oh, maybe I should. Sorry, I'm not, I really don't. I'm looking at it this way, so I should turn these around. This way. There. Uh, the next wall, this, this is a, a little bit of a wall. It's important. It's. Uh, it's the wall that you see in the center of the slide on the left. Uh, it contains the most exaggerated carving of a fireplace in the living room. It has a window to the right of that fireplace out to a diagonal view and into a, a fish pond and so forth. Uh, uh, some steps up, uh, the intersection with the main uh, corridor, the, some more steps up and onto a large dining zone, uh, which is marked by the double piers in the plan. Uh, and uh, the point at the center is the point of entry into the house. There's a, there's a porch and, and, a, and a large entry door at that point. Then into the yellow zone in the model, uh, a, a pair of walls that bracket a, uh, a gravel rock garden, uh, which has ceramic sculpture set within the rocks, out on into the landscape until it disappears under the contours. The fourth wall of the house is really the first wall which you experience, and not from this side. Uh, it's the entrance and kitchen wall of the house, and uh, uh, we're looking at it, in this case, uh, from the left to the right. The entrance is from the right to the left, as you can see, uh, kitchens and garages and things like that. Uh, a gateway is placed in the notch of the wall. To your left as you enter, uh, the wall has a, a fountain in it, and the, the water comes out of the top of the wall and then falls down the, step, the stepping of the wall in a series of waterfalls, and then finally out into a fish pond. So that the, that the wall, in this case, is a source of a fountain. Uh, it immediately rises up to a high chimney, which marks the corner of the entrance. And the, the chimney, of course, is for the, the fireplace, which is uh, the, the large family fireplace in the kitchen dining room. And then there are penetrations in the wall for kitchen equipment, and then finally out into a, a greenhouse structure to the, to the left. Uh, the style of drawing and the level of resolution of this project, again, reminds me of a drawing that I made. This is 1976, I suppose. I made that drawing. And I can remember the incident that surrounded that, the making of that drawing. It was really the first presentation drawing that I was going to show the Nilsons, and I was uh, a little bit uptight. I didn't know whether how it would go. Um, I had made some sketches for them before, and they were very receptive to that. But this was really going to be, OK now, folks, this is really it. We really want to do this one. And so I wanted it to be a bit professional. I wanted it to, to have a kind of solidity and meaning. Uh, and so I did the usual thing. I, went, I made the drawing, and I made, made a print of the drawing, and I colored it with colored pencils. And the coloring turned out a little strange, but 
I didn't mind that too much. I went ahead and I spray mounted it to a, a piece of cardboard to make it look more important and put it in the back of the car and uh, set out for my meeting. Um, but I, I always get upset when I haven't eaten, so I stopped and, and uh, went into a restaurant, um, got sane, everything was fine, came out ready for my meeting. And the heat of the car, of the closed car, had warped the cardboard, had wrinkled the drawing, and it made a complete mess of the whole thing. Um, my anxiety level rose again. And uh, you see, I didn't have this. I, it would have been fun to walk in with this and say, aha, you see. That was to come a little bit later. Uh, and so I, I, I had to rely on on, on somehow engaging their imagination with something that the drawing was supposed to do. I was trying to get them behind the project, trying to get, get them interested in the energy of the project. And now I had a mess, and how could you get someone interested in the energy of a mess? <laughs> uh, so I took it, took it back to the studio quickly and cut some, uh, with an X-Acto knife, cut some lines in it and used a burnisher and tried to push the bubbles out, you know, so that the, the mess would disappear out of the cuts and I made a bigger mess. Uh, uh, with the X-Acto knife in hand, there was little left to do, but sort of chop it all up and put it in a box. Uh, now I was ready for my meeting. Uh, the meeting went well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the energy level was maintained, the sense of, 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 of play, uh, the, the spirit of, of uh, recreation uh, occurred. Uh, as you can see, these are quite large, simple pieces. This was an early presentation, and so I used a preschool level jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> I learned a lot. I mean, I learned not to take myself so seriously. Uh, I, I learned how to make jigsaw puzzles in a hurry. And I learned also what to do with old drawings so to make them look better. Uh, but it made me uh, uh, especially aware of the value of toys uh, in dealing with oneself, in dealing with one's friends, and in dealing with architecture. And so uh, one becomes a kind of uh, Geppetto Stupnagel, uh, finding uh, ways in which to cut, to fold, to scratch, to tear, to, uh, to invent, uh, or, or just to let it be as ordinary as can be, uh, to go out behind the grocery store and, and to get a box and, and cut it up and, and live in that box. This was all made out of grocery store uh, boxes. They're printed on the other side. Um, these are two toys, uh, which are the components for the, the, the project then. Uh, the project being um, the making of that funny house in uh, just off of, uh, of uh, well, up well, it's Woodrow Wilson Drive. It's up, it's on Woodrow Wilson Drive, and uh, there's funny, lots of funny houses sort of jostling against one another there. And this is just one among many funny houses. And uh, uh, the man who lives there said uh, it was kind of tight. It was there was one series of rooms, uh, uh, one room after another, uh, no particular flow between the rooms. All the walls between the rooms were bearing walls. Uh, some contractor had figured out how to do the whole thing with two by four joists or something. And so uh, uh, the house had sort of grown in a linear fashion, as we say in architecture, uh, and, and it had grown all out of proportion uh, with the kind of activities that were to take place in it, where places where people would get together and spend an evening and listen to music and have fun. And it was all being done in these crazy little dark compartments strung together. And so what was needed was something like this, uh, something which could uh, could sort of jump over as a kind of, uh, um, uh, well, piggyback. To could crawl over on the back of the house and make a big, long, uh, enveloping space into which all the little uh, cubby spaces could then uh, relate. But to get on with it, shall we? Uh, make a model of the house, make it as funky and as cute and as uh, ramshackle as the building itself. Uh, show it all bent and twisted. Uh, proposed then that we take off all the stuff, take off the back of it, uh, strip it down like that, expose all that, that series of compartments, and then uh, uh, to put the next toy, put the first toy in place, 
uh, the toy that would take us out of the swimming pool or into it, uh, up onto another level, past an upstairs bedroom, uh, into a, a convenient bathroom, which is in black there, up some more stairs, looking down all the time into the large space, which is getting larger, uh, to the right, uh, around a fireplace, possibly even crawling down the staircase on the fireplace, uh, up to a, a sleeping loft for children in the springtime, uh, on out the door and uh, to uh, a terrace which uh, has a stair way at the back and uh, lands on top of the garage and uh, a place where there's a, a place with barbells and, uh, and video cassette gear. Uh, non sequiturs. Uh, <laughs> then all of this is, is wrapped over with a duffel coat of a roof and uh, uh, so that's how it was done. Uh, Say, so what was that? Uh, the house. Uh, one more time. Uh, the model, the torn away house. Uh, the piece to put in front of the torn away house. Um, putting that in place. Uh, the piece that would envelop, that would reproportionalize, that would make a, a roofed volume with a chimney penetration. And put that in place. And the job's done. I never made a, a single drawing of this project to this point. The only thing I've done is played with this toy. Sometimes the sight, uh, the finger of God points down and shouts at you very strongly and says, build here, build this way, this is the only thing to do. And uh, all you can do is sit down and, and make a, a rendering to give to a bank and say, all right. But at the same time, uh, one's duffel coat building of uh, uh, for the Hollywood House is leaning against uh, the conference center uh, in the same way that it leans against that ramshackled uh, semi-American uh, country house. And uh, uh, a Nielsen House chimney can decorate the roof. Uh, the, the groundscape of the UCLA Extension Building is used as a way to organize motion and movement. And then finally, uh, uh, one gets a provisional uh, gesture toward architecture all done in, in the uh, Arrowhead Association rustic style. Uh, uh, the site and its forces, its energies, its views, its sunlight, uh, and, and, and just the, the very uh, vector analysis of the site itself uh, sometimes indicate very strongly what's to be done. Uh, there's a pile of logs. Uh, that pile of logs uh, lies across uh, in this direction, this, these are both in the same orientation. There's another pile of logs, which right now is standing in for one of the fat walls uh, until we get the fat wall built. Uh, this was also the first time that I, that I used the sketch medium of, uh, of a coffee can full of lime uh, drawing on the earth uh, to design the house. You can see the stage in which the design is so far developed. It's still in kind of a rough schematic state. But here was an opportunity to go to the site and to draw the building on the site with lime, uh, the way contractors do when they're getting ready to call out the trenchers, uh, and, and to provide an architecture, a virtual architecture on the ground uh, that would stand in for uh, a later architecture. Uh, and then sometimes uh, it's simply a question of before and after. Uh, the view on the left taken from the house in which Harry and Una Nielsen lived, and uh, the view taken from the, the same house in which they no longer live because they moved in over there. They looked out the window one day and said, there. And uh, a few years later, okay. Okay, that, that was, those were notations about a kind of combined process of, of wanting to look at one's work in a, in a kind of cross-referential way. Um, there's, of course, the complete full presentation that needs to be done for a particular project. I may not get to that, but I'll begin by pointing out a few things, uh, uh, by uh, g gesturing toward a, a kind of uh, occupation of, of this piece of land. In this case, not my work, uh, but the work of Lita Albuquerque, uh, who came by one day when photography was being done at the Nielsen House and, uh, and created a, a piece of ephemeral and instant art which energized and charged the entire entrance courtyard and, and, and gave, to, to it sort of reinstated that energy level, which was so important, that uh, the energy produced the piece, the piece produced an additional flow of energy, and, and, and things uh, intensified. 
That was a moment in time. Right now, that's a blacktop driveway. Tell us the story about the door, the window, the roof, and the chimney. Oh, all right. No, not that one again. The character of the house is an exemplification of an ordinary childhood dream and a picture of that dream. Ask a child in a high-rise apartment building what a house looks like, and they'll draw something like the thing on the left, um, regardless of, of whether that child lives on the 13th floor or the first floor or the 40th floor, uh, because that to them is the concept house. Now, that concept house is a reality. It's a semantic reality. It's a practical reality for many people. Uh, it was chosen in this case as a logo for a record company. Uh, for much the same reasons, because it seemed practical, it seemed accessible, it seemed genuine, uh, and, and so it just came into being that way. Uh, and, and that was the way in which uh, we began conversations uh, with the Nilsons, is that we wanted something practical, genuine, comfortable, real, and, uh, and yet full of the kind of heightened and intensified meaning that the child's drawing of the house has rather than the child who lives in the high-rise apartment house, his reality of house. And so uh, uh, the, the facts of the matter were intensified and distorted. Uh, the, the door was made nine feet high instead of the usual, uh, five feet wide. Uh, the transom window overhead was uh, uh, left empty of glass in some cases. and, and and then the roof was condensed into a tiny little uh, cap piece and made out of a different material. Uh, the chimney was, uh, was flavored with a, with a sort of uh, upside down staircaseedness. And uh, the roof uh, then became something that was simultaneously organizing and sheltering. Did I miss something? The, the, uh, the notion of the architecture intended was also what Aldo van Eyck asked all architecture to be, especially a house, and that is build homecoming. Uh, a notion that, that, that architecture has within it the capacity to produce a sense of comfort of arrival and to uh, make specific gestures along those lines, uh, to hold out an availability of, of protection and comfort and of security, but at the same time, uh, uh, to maintain a certain public decorum in the face of doing that. And so a kind of cartoon drawing, uh, another one of those sort of telephone cartoon drawings, and then uh, the same idea later on treated as a, uh, as, as a serious, more serious proposition. The house should also be a member of an architectural and a social community that uh, uh, in a situation where uh, there is a self-conscious desire for a great house, and that's certainly the case in Upper Bel Air, uh, and even slide is out of focus still. Could focus the slide, please, on the right. Um, then, uh, then it becomes a necessary uh, ingredient to the theoretical composition of the architecture. Uh, so that, that the idea of publicness is something which is expressed in the architecture. And the proportionality of publicness and the, the scale of publicness and the sense of publicness and the belonging to a site and to an architectural community is given. At the same time, one wants to indulge one's private whim whimsies, one's appetites, uh, one's desire for uh, complexity and idiosyncrasy. And, and so uh, there's, uh, there's another logic which operates uh, within the same, within the alternate domain of the house, the house which is protected in, in next to the, to the mountain. A series of retaining walls, outdoor rooms, uh, uh, trellised or, or planted areas of uh, different uh, floor treatments, and so forth and so on and so on, so on uh, are a way to uh, create a set of uh, personally defined and uh, individually emphasized places. A house should be a castle. It should be something uh, where pride is, uh, is an overreaching, transcendent quality. And it should also be a playpen. It should, be, uh, it should provide a sense of comfort, a sense of uh, 
of uh, indefinite happeningness. Uh, it, it should allow uh, giggles and silly rolling on the floor. And at the same time, at any point, one should be able to uh, stand up and uh, retain one's dignity. Uh, and so a house should have uh, a quality sometimes of, of a grandiose monumentality, and a house can at the same time uh, offer the spirit of, of uh, domestic intimacy. Uh, the principle, the architectural principle now of the house, given those sort of spiritual criteria, uh, is, is devised in this way then. Uh, intellectually, the house wants to gain membership in the history of architecture, does in all our work. Uh, that, uh, that the use, therefore, of a colonnade, which has always been a neutral uh, architectural element in architecture, it's always been something which is a public availability in architecture. It's not something that you put in a bedroom, for example. Uh, it's, it's something which, uh, to which uh, the uh, individually crafted or the, uh, the personally occupied domains of architecture are always referencing back to and, and from which they derive a larger sense of order and organization. So the colonnade uh, became a traditional principle of organization which was exploited in the making of a house. Uh, and yet the colonnade itself had to be, I think, subjected to some kind of playful maneuvering. And so rather than a regular spacing of frames, the colonnade here is, is an unpredictable and clumsy and, and disordered uh, spacing of frames, at least from uh, the first take, the first sort of geometric uh, guess as to how you would space frames. Uh, but uh, what is in fact intended here is that the frames, each pair of frames uh, signifies a particular place. So that the first pair of frames at the left is the place of front porch of entry, there's a larger space just inside which takes you into and yet slows you within the space. And then a, a greater spacing beyond that which tends to speed you on your way, uh, penetrating well into the house. But then a quick stop, a place of orientation and change, and another uh, uh, space of, of, of movement and of change of tempo and orientation, another quick stop and so forth and so on. I'll try to take you on a, on a tour of, of some of this. But before I do that, uh, uh, this was a, a drawing, I guess we make these drawings. Very few of these drawings, by the way, are architects' normal drawings, right? The, these are drawings which one makes as an appeal to and as a uh, study of architecture rather than uh, drawings which one makes in order to uh, uh, you know, fulfill one's contractual obligations or to, uh, as a sales pitch for or, you know, a, a banker or, or for an architectural firm. Um, but this drawing turned out to be quite important to me, and I didn't realize how important it was going to be. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about its importance. Uh, it was a drawing which raised again for me the question of a frame architecture in juxtaposition to a kind of plastically modeled architecture. As you can see, it's not a complete drawing. It, it leaves out most of the house. In fact, it leaves out anything that anyone would normally associate with a house. It's only a drawing of a kind of ghost which might inhabit the house, but, but not really a drawing of a house. It's a drawing of an architectural proposition. Because in particularly in the drawing in the right, where the frame is taken out explicitly and all you see is its footprints, then, uh, then you can see that you can have a perfectly fine house without that frame. But uh, the frame was drawn and stayed on my desk and thought about and the construction went ahead and did proceed. And uh, one day, a certain concept was validated. Uh, walked out on the construction site, and there was something which I thought was only a concept, turned out to be uh, a constituent fact of the building. I mean, it's not that I didn't know the steel was going to be there. It's not that I'd, you know, I couldn't have anticipated something like this of happening. But this is a, an instant within the process. This is an ephemeral observation of the process, but a, but that observation which validates a certain principle. Now you say, well, so what? The guy's got a steel frame in his building. He, earthquake country, you need that. You know? And uh, yes, it, it does make a kind of conceptual art piece.